we are in the office of Sigida, our portfolio company. And I have here Said Biso, the founder and CEO of the company. How did you come together with four completely different founders from different geographies, different backgrounds, and decided to start Zedita? It was very clear for us that um, you know cloud was going to win in terms of uh, centralized compute and running these applications. But what we uh, started looking at is how will cloud change with IoT? But IoT has been around and people have been talking about it for ages and it wasn't happening and it wasn't happening again and again, actually. It was delayed so many times. I think you notice early, early in a new market or new idea is that you're doing a lot of education. I meet customers that have on their own came to that same conclusions. And we've had a customer a few recently that basically designed the requirements exactly to our product. And then magical things happen. That's actually what happened when you came to Peach Art the first time. It was uh, the only experience I had where you guys had so much belief, you gave us a blank term sheet, and I remember you guys saying, just fill in the number and sign it. Biggest struggle right now. You have to realize this is not a zero-sum game out there, right? It's not like, you know, we all win and they lose. There is a win-win possible, and you have to find that win-win. And if you create that, you can create an enduring company and market. <laughs> Hi there, this is Tanya Dadashova with Almas Capital and today we are in the office of Zedida, our portfolio company. And I have here Said Biso, the founder and CEO of the company. Hi Said. Hi Tanya. Yeah, thanks for having us here in um, Zedida's office. It's uh, actually, uh, can, you, can you maybe start discussing how the company came together, what's behind the name of it? And um, actually the design of the office as well, because it matches the name and yeah. the design. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, maybe a few words around uh, the company. So uh, there's four founders of us, so I'm one of the four. Um, and uh, all of us came from very different backgrounds. So when we came together and decided on the company, we had to come up with a name. So all of us came with different suggestions. And the name that, you know, I guess I won was a name that actually has to do with my background. Um, so I'm actually originally from the Netherlands. And if you follow any Dutch soccer, you know that the color of the Dutch is orange. So that explains why we like orange. Um, and the other part of the name, actually, the name itself comes from my uh, background being Moroccan. And Zadida is actually a Moroccan word, and it means something innovative or new. So we combined all these factors, we had a little um, competition, and here we are. <laughs> so the others lost completely, they have no input in it. Well, they, they won other things, but they didn't win the name. <laughs> yeah, they sometimes won in pron pronouncing it, because they pronounce it in Russian way, for example, which is a bit different, right? We, I've heard it pronounced in many ways. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, I think what matters most is not only pronunciation, uh, but you know, it's Zadida if you really want to, to say it the right way. Okay, so uh, how, how did you come together with four completely different founders from different geographies, different backgrounds, and decided to start Zadida? What's the yeah. story? Yeah, so, uh, so the original uh, premise or idea was that uh, the four of us, I think, had been looking at the market trends from each personal vantage point. And it was very clear for us that um, you know, cloud was going to win in terms of uh, centralized compute and running these applications. But what we uh, started looking at is how will cloud change with IoT? And what we realized was that you know, the amount of data that's going to be generated at the edge of the network is going to be humongous. Um, and it's too much data to all upload to the cloud. Yet we need to process and analyze that data in probably cloud native ways. And this is where we realize like, if we can't get the data to the cloud, then is there a way for us to actually take part of the application and move it to the edge of the network? Um, and that's where we realize that this is going to happen. IoT is going to happen. People will need to analyze and process data, and therefore, edge computing is going to happen. But all of us came to this conclusion of us because one of my founders, Roman, he came from the, the, the developer point of view. One of the other ones came from a networking point of view. Uh, and another person came from an operating system point of view. So we found each other through luck and um, speed dating, et cetera. And which you one know, was you? Which one was me? Yeah. I, I saw it from the business point of view. So okay. I, I, my background has been in product management uh, for many years, uh, developing, defining, and getting products to customers. So I, I saw the, the business opportunity there. But IoT has been around and people have been talking about it for ages, and it wasn't happening. And it wasn't happening again and again, actually. It was delayed so many times. So uh, why did you decide at the right moment? And uh, also, 
edge is defined very differently by different people. Yeah. Same as uh, so uh, same as IoT actually. But the question is, how did you choose the right spot for 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 the new company in this whole range of definitions and yeah. So, yeah. I think this comes back to any company you start, uh, and this is my first one, so I had to learn a lot on my own. But I think it starts with um, instead of trying to already put in your head what the product needs to be and what the market needs to be, I think you got to go out and meet actual customers. And the problem with a new product in a new market is that there's no definition. It's not like somebody, everybody already knows what to build. It's not like we're building a faster router or a faster uh, something that exists, exists today. So you, it's almost like describing an elephant while you're blindfolded. So you go in and you meet customers and you let them talk to you about what are they doing on IoT? How do they think they're going to get the data to the cloud? How, how, what are the ways they're doing it today? And what are the problems they're running into? And you need to have a very large data set. So you need to talk to a lot of people. So the first 12 months of the company, we didn't write a lot of code. We actually were constantly on calls using our networks and partners and relationships just to meet people that could potentially be customers and, and learn from them and understand the problems they would run into. And that helped us a lot to actually create um, a small, well-defined, minimal viable product. And then we started raising money and committing resources and building that. Yeah, and so who, and I don't necessarily mean one name, but who was this initial client of yours that helped you define this uh, minimal viable product? Yeah, I would say it was, so, so we looked at it from a vertical point of view. And I think that's the other thing with IoT. IoT is in itself not, it's not a product, it's, it's more a trend. Um, so we said, okay, well, what verticals would be the first ones that would need something around this idea of edge computing, that would run into these problems that would require edge computing? So we said we need verticals that are uh, hard verticals, meaning they have physical assets like um, wind energy or oil and gas or industrial manufacturing. The second thing we said, ideally, that have very poor network connectivity because the poorer the network, the more likely you need to process the data on prem. So that put us into like oil and gas, right? They, they operate in the middle of nowhere, et cetera. Um, and the last thing we, we said, it's, it's verticals ideally that today are already very data heavy. They already are analyzing a lot of data. They're already trying to make sense of data and they need to now have that connected back to the cloud. So those were the type of accounts we went after. So our first customers were renewable customers. They were uh, industrial customers, oil and gas customers, utilities. Those were the first ones that really uh, ended up being our customers as well. So it sounds like yeah, the first company you did, but you approached it in a very like right way. Any mistakes on the way? Oh, many. <laughs> yeah. I think it's normal to make mistakes. Um, I I don't think you can create a. There's no perfect path to these things, and you know, there's great days, there's not so great days. I think that's the part of the journey of of doing something new, like a startup. Um, yeah, we made mistakes. We, we, there were, we went down certain routes or we assumed certain things that we had to come back from. Um, I think the biggest th thing is you learn from them. You integrate with them. You don't look at a mistake as a failure. You look at it as a learning opportunity um, and you know, try to do better next time. And I think that's the key thing you can do, the only thing you can do, frankly. Yeah, so any, any, any particular ones were they in product, devi defining the product? Or finding the product market fit, or maybe in conversations with investors. I don't know. Um, I, you know, I think uh, on the investors we got really lucky, and we have you guys and others. You were one of our first, uh, really, that I think understood what we were trying to do, and also understood it was an early market, and I think understood that you would need, um, you know, patience and focus to get there. Um, so I think that part of it, I feel pretty good about. I mean, I think things like, um, you know, when, when you're building a product that sits at the intersection of networking, cloud computing, open source and security, you have to bring in people from very different backgrounds and cultures and make them work together. That doesn't always go great. We, we hired people, we thought this is going to grow great. And for whatever reason, there was no chemistry or we didn't get out of it. So that's something you, you only find out by trying. Um, we've, we've had customers that took us down a route and said, hey, if you build this, we will, we will buy it. And then midway, they said, you know what? We're changing our plans. The companies sometimes do that. So those are probably the typical things, but I wouldn't say they were fatal. They were, at the end, we got better to qualify customers. We got better at hiring people. We got better in defining the culture we wanted in the company and ultimately made us as a company better. Actually, on, on your last point about uh, coming to a client and then the client changing the mind, since it's basically a new trend and a lot of companies are just starting to try it, 
how do you def how how do you tell it? Is it actually ed you educating them, or they already made a strategic choice and then you just fit into this? So, uh, does it actually happen a lot that the company doesn't know yet? what they want to get when they start conversations with you. Yeah, I think in any new market, the, the requirements are not fully understood yet. So I think it's natural. So I, I think you notice early, early in a new market or new idea is that you're doing a lot of education and you will sometimes feel, find people that disagree with you in the meeting and say, well, that's not, that's not the way it's gonna be or that's not the way the world will, will pan out. Uh, and you, you have to think about that and say, okay, Am I wrong? Are they wrong? Or are we both wrong, right? Or both right, right? So I think that's part of, of that. I did notice that as time progressed, we started seeing more and more agreement and validation to some of the key assumptions that we had early on. So that gave me the feeling we're on the right path. You know, we're heading sort of in the right direction. Maybe we're not exactly on course, but we're not going away, we're going towards it. What I've seen definitely in the last a couple of uh, you know years is that I meet customers that have on their own came to that same conclusions. And we've had a customer a few recently that basically designed the requirements exactly to our product. And then magical things happen, right? Because they're like, how did you know? <laughs> and we're like, how did you know? And then it goes really fast. And before you know it, you, you're you know trialing it, you're talking about the relationship, how to help each other. Uh, and those are really the best meetings you can have. Yeah, that's actually what happened when you came to Peach Hub the first time. As, as as investors, because when it happened, I, I remember it was 2017, right? So yep, four years ago. Very early, yeah. Very early, and <laughs> we liked the idea and the company so much, and you were not even fundraising, right? So we just gave you the term blank term sheet. It uh, it was uh, the only experience I had where you guys had so much belief. You gave us a blank term sheet, and I remember you guys saying, "Just fill in the number and sign it." And I think you know that meant a lot to us. It meant that you know you believed the idea, you believed the vision, you were ready to you know commit to the relationship, and you know uh, at the end uh, you did, and you've been with us, and really thank you for all your support. Yeah, it's it has been a very interesting journey, <laughs> and, and and I mean it's it's obviously not at its end. There is a lot going on forward. So, what do you think is like the biggest struggle right now? So, what is uh, the things that you're trying to, to find out as a next step to scale faster, to move faster? Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, ultimately, I think startups that are successful, they, they focus on doing one thing really well. And, and we've always had that uh, uh, mentality. There is a famous book, uh, you know, uh, called From Zero to One, uh, you know, so from Thiel. So, you know, it really, um, Peter Thiel, it really explains like how you think about building something that didn't exist before. Um, and I think as a startup, you have to think, especially early days, always zero to one. My first customer, um, my first million dollars of revenue, uh, my first hire, my first, day, everything is zero to one, really. And but that's not only good things. It's like the first person you fire and how you deal yeah, with it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's everything is zero. Yeah. So and but I think it, it, it you have to be very very focused, right? I think the zero to one is really about being super focused. And the challenge is when things start to go well and things start to click, then automatically we all kick into one to end. Let's start doing more things at the same time, and really having the discipline to know exactly when you're still in zero to one mode and when you're in one to end mode. I think that's the biggest challenge, and frankly, it gets more and more challenging as things go well because you're naturally want to put more money in, you want to hire more people, you want to fi find more customers. But you have to be realistic where you are, and I call it the eyes versus the stomach. We always have big eyes, tiny stomach as a startup. You have to not forget that it's not only about winning those customers, but you have to also deploy them successfully and make them excited to buy more. And that is effort, and that that's requires focus. But actually, for the data, it's not just users as customers, because as customers, you also have like developer community because it's open source. So they're also kind of customers. Absolutely. Yes, you of course have industrial customers and any startup, you also have VCs in some way as customers. Yes. So how do you handle it all? How do you manage it in, in your time? Uh, how, how do you manage your focus, the team focus? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Well, <laughs> time management is essential. I mean, I, I think, um, uh, ultimately, our, the, the, we as a company actually sat together and when we defined our mission, it was really about how, how do we delight customers and making edge computing you know, effortless. Um, and so, so I think it's always coming down to the customer, right? And the customer is the one that buys your product and you want to make sure that you, you make them successful and you have to be customer first centric. I think that's the first priority is like, 
customers go first, right? So if you have conflicts and schedule, we always prioritize customer meetings. If a call, call comes in, it's a customer, let's give that the priority. I think that's that's the, the first and, and, uh, and foremost thing in terms of um, uh, w how to focus and, and get that going. Um, and I think you have to, sometimes people forget about the existing customers. They're so excited about the next customer that you forget about you have actually existing ones and it's equally important to make them happy because frankly, a happy customer is your best salesperson. And, and we've seen that, we've had customers say, we want to talk to some of your other customers. And you know what you want is to put a, people in front of them that are super excited. But actually that works for VCs as well, because when we do diligence and we talk to customer and customer is super excited and saying how great this is working for the whole industry and them. That's why it's yeah. customer first. If you, so when you have happy customers, you will have, uh, first of all, happy investors. <laughs> yeah. You also have a happy team because your engineering team builds a product, not because it's fun to build a product, but they want to see that product you know, being used and deployed. So again, if you have uh, customers, then that happens by itself and then you'll do that. And then when you have customers, then also you can build a strong partnership and uh, an ecosystem and everything else around partners and ecosystem around that. And finally, even on the open source, we've seen that as well. We've open sourced our software. Open source is in the DNA of our company. Um, and we noticed that the open source project got more excitement when people realized there's actually customers contributing code or commenting or, or being part of the forums or the calls or whatever we have. So it ultimately, I think it always comes down to customer first. Then the question is, if it's customers first, and the customers are large, usually enterprises, right? Industrial segment is always like that. And I mean, it's usually big checks and it's important for the company. So how do you manage not to get too focused on creating features for them, not turning into a service, basically serving them, but still keep the focus on product-centric approach that, that can be scalable and repeatable rather than going into like a very long backlog of their asks? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So. Again, uh, we said you build the MVP, right? And, and the first thing you need to do is when you build that MVP is instead of worrying all the 20,000 other features you can do is make the MVP really, really good. And you know, you know you can always make it better, more scalable, more stable. Um, you know, there's always little knobs and things you can add, but you, they don't take you away from the actual core product, right? Once you have that, that's the core, right? That's what you take to the customer, say, this is what I have. They're gonna come in and say, hey, we want this, we want that. And then you have to be very strong in the product management view where say, does this make the MVP um, better and make the, uh, not just a minimal viable, but better viable product? Or does this really take me away from my original ideas and philosophy around the product? And if it does, you know, then you need to figure out what partners can I bring in to help with that. So to your point, if the customer says, hey, I love your, I love your orchestration solution, but can you help us build the app that analyzes the data at the edge? This is where we, we say, hey, we would love to do that, but that we're not as good in that as others. We can actually bring you a system integrator that can work with you, a partner of us we like, or we can bring you an application vendor that has built maybe a data analytics application that is close to what you want. And now you are starting to create that ecosystem where the customer sees you not only as somebody that's trying to sell you something, but you're trying to make them successful. And you're starting to look at your own network and people you know that can help to uh, you know, realize the goal. And then that builds trust with the customer yeah. because the customer realizes that you're in it for them and their outcome, not just getting a deal. So the ecosystem approach is like, ultimately what brings value to them, but you are the way to bring value. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then for us, the beauty as our company is once we bring an application to a customer and we onboard that on our system, any uh, customer in the future that needs that application immediately can take advantage of it because we already learned how to do it. We already made a part of our ecosystem. So that builds the network effect, which you know builds valuable companies as we know. And also these partners ecosystem, they can be contributing in many other ways and not just in the different value-added services or code, they can become investors, as we know. Th that's one. We can have investors come in. They, they, can, they will open up more opportunities. If you bring them a deal, they may bring you a deal in, a, in the future. And that's why I think you know, a lot of startups, they, you know, we always have big vision and ideas, uh, and we want to do everything out there. But you have to realize this is not a zero-sum game out there, right? It's not like you know, we all win and they lose. There is a win-win possible, and you have to find that win-win. And if you create that, you can create an enduring company and market. But that's what open source is all about. Isn't 100%. It? And so open, it's source it's is, <laughs> open source is open yeah. source is the best example of that model. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Now that's a very interesting story and a great journey, actually. Excited to continue it with you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for you. all your support. Thank you.